Hello, this is Nathan Beverly, and welcome to Call for Salt. Um, if you haven't taken a look at my channel, I'd recommend that you just scroll down through some of the videos and take a look at some of the topics that I cover. Um, but my main theme is being the salt and light. As Christians, we, sh we should be salt and light, not only in our culture, but in our churches, and how we need to rec recognize what time it is, especially in our context in America, and how we need to stand for the gospel in every aspect of life. And that does include politics as well. Um, that's something that we, we tend to shy away from, but that, that I show how that's interconnected um, as well. With that being said, I have been doing some videos lately on Alistair Begg and the compromise with the... Uh, his, his advice to go to a gay wedding um, provided that, um, that that people are not, that the person that he gave that advice to um, had, prov had given the information that um, they were not affirming to their gay loved one. Um, he gave that advice. Obviously, this has been on social media a lot, and I have done five or six videos already. I think it's six on this subject. So tonight I want to do something different. Um, it is relating to that, but I'm not talking a lot about Alistair Begg in particular. I'm actually talking, uh, I'm going to be going through an article written by a good friend of mine um, that really, I believe, hits gets to the heart of this issue. It, it really strikes right where it's as far down as it needs to go. And I think it really clears any muddiness, any um, confusion up on, on what the scripture actually says. I, I know we're getting a lot of pushback, those of us that are on YouTube, those of us that are trying to bring truth here um, and, and trying to hold to the truth. Um, I understand there's a lot of questions. I understand there's a lot of people that, that don't want to rush to judgment. I get that. We should all be careful to before we rush to judgment on any matter. Um, but this, uh, my friend has written an article on his website, on his uh, blog, um, that is just absolutely, um, it really, it really helps. Um, his name is Chris Goff. Um, I'm a member of his church and also a member of his growth group, his life group. I've known him for a number of years. He's a solid guy, loves the Lord. <clears throat> He's not just, uh, just a guy just starting out, just saying whatever comes to his head. He really thinks through everything. He thinks through scripture. He knows scripture well, and, um, he does not come to these positions lightly at all. So, <clears throat> With that being said, I want to get into this article. I'm going to read through the article, and I'm going to comment on uh, it as I go through, and uh, hopefully not comment too much, let him speak for himself, but it really resonates with me. Um, I do want to put in a couple plugs for him before I start. He's uh, he actually, this is the website that this is on, and I will put it in the description notes, the description of my YouTube channel, so you can get the link. But it's on readythebride.com. He has a blog page, uh, called, a blog website called ready the, readythebride.com. And this article is on there. You can read it. Um, he also wrote a book um, called The Elementary Gospel. Um, this is a book that I've actually read myself. I'm actually planning to do a YouTube video at some point on that video, on that book. And I want to interview Chris um, because it, it impacted my life that much. Um, it, it is about how the foundational elements of the gospel and how the church needs to shore those up, how the church needs to see what the, what the Bible is actually saying on the foundational elements, um, how some things have gotten de-emphasized um, over the years, and what really is important about presenting the gospel and teaching and discipling, um, and, and knowing, having assurance of our salvation, knowing what the marks of a true believer are. Um, and it also he also deals with the sin that leads to death. So if you're intrigued by any of that, I recommend getting his book. You can go to theelementarygospel.com. He has a website where you can get a link to purchase that paperback uh, copy. I believe it's $9.99. Um, I highly recommend it. I have a copy myself. Sorry, I have to drink to keep my voice um, from losing my voice here. But I believe, uh, yeah, I've read a, I've read the copy. I've read my own copy. I've marked it up. Um, it just impacted my life. It, so much of it resonated with what I've been thinking for a lot, and I just couldn't put it into words. And he articul articulates it so well. It's full of scriptural support and is just, uh, I think it's a message that the church needs to hear today, uh, probably more than anything else. So with that being said, I'm going to uh, continue. Uh, I'm going to start reading this article by Chris Goff. Um, and I hope you are blessed. Keep in mind, keep, uh, keep an eye out towards the end. He does, 
not only does he hit the nail on the head and gets right to the heart of the matter, but at the end, he, he has a point that really uh, shows the consequential nature of, of attending a gay wedding and how serious this really is and, it, and it, what it means for real life. And that is what we all deal with. So I think that it, it will really, really challenge you and help you, encourage you, hopefully, to, to hold fast to Christ um, and to have the right balance, have the right balance on everything. So here we go. I'm going to start reading the, the I'm, I'm on my phone, so it's, forgive me if I'm squinting a little bit. Um, I'm trying to look, not to look away from the screen too much. <clears throat> and I might take a, a drink every once in a while. But here we go. Um, the, the article is entitled, <clears throat> Balancing Christian Compassion Without Betraying Loyalty to Christ. Balancing Christian compassion without betraying loyalty to Christ. We hear that word compassion a lot. Uh, Alistair Begg used that in his sermon, um, con compassion versus condemnation, or it might be the other way around, but he he uh, pitted those two things against each other. And um, Chris here is, it wants to talk about compassion and making sure that we have that. So he's trying to be balanced, and he I believe he is very balanced, but he also wants to make sure that we're making sure that we do not betray our loyalty to Christ. And that is absolutely key. And we're going to see what that, what, how that works out here. So he says, should Christians attend the legal union of LGBTQ uh, plus friends and family? In the introduction, in recent years, I have cultivated the strong conviction that some popular and some well-meaning theologians, pastors, and teachers have confused certain aspects regarding how to apply Christian compassion and love when dealing with unbelievers and subsequently the application with regard to how Christians are permitted to build bridges with the world. This at times has been at the expense of the loyalty of loyalty to Christ and fidelity to scriptures. So, I mean, I think it's all fair that we can all understand, we can all uh, come to agreement that we don't want to sacrifice our loyalty to Christ. We don't want to deny unwittingly or un unwittingly deny um, the truth of Christ um, because we're trying to build that bridge so far towards the world that we that we cross lines that we shouldn't cross. <clears throat> and he says, "I'm." Uh, and he he uh, emboldens certain parts in here, and I'm going to let you know when he emboldens because he wants those are some things he wants to highlight, and I think they're important to to know that. Um, he says emboldens this. He says this at times has been at the expense of the loyalty to Christ and fidelity. To scriptures. I am sure some will bristle at such a statement and will entertain thoughts such as, who are you? How do you have the right to say that tr what train that trained Bible teachers have this wrong? What's your education? <clears throat> Here is my appeal to you. In the interest in, in diving into the scriptures together, put a hold on those thoughts and see if the picture I attempt to paint from scripture brings an angle to this issue you may not have thought of. I would also like to say up front that many of these aforementioned leaders know way more than I do when it comes to the scriptures in general. I readily admit that I, re I readily admit that. However, I do think it is also important for them to exercise humility in not assuming that they are indeed well versed in every important area of their credentials or experience. We all need humility, right? Um, a degree or having experience doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have the right interpretation on things is what I believe what he's what he's getting at here. <clears throat> he says we need and he, and he highlights he, he emboldens this part. He says we need to be aware of of and migrate away from a subtle appeal to the authority fallacy. R rather, we need to follow which teaching actually makes the most sense. What makes sense with scripture? Doesn't that shouldn't we follow that more than hey, it's my my pet teacher or my pet teacher, my my beloved teacher that I've followed all my life. He led me to the Lord or he discipled me and I'm I just listen to him. He's gotta be have an in with God more than you know, more than me or more than so, in, enough so that I can just take his word for it automatically. Sometimes we subtly we maybe we we have those thoughts, we don't realize it. Um, but he says that's a that's an that's an appeal to authority fallacy. He says, rather, we need to follow which teaching actually makes the most sense, right? Uh, with keep with keeping the integrity of God's intentions for his church. 
With all that said, I invite any theologian, pastor, or teacher to be critical of this case using Scripture to do so. If you bring an equally compelling case from Scripture, I will strive to follow the evidence wherever it leads. <clears throat> that should be our hearts as Christians. What does God really say and think about this issue? And how should we then proceed? You know, what God says is the most important thing. And the Scripture is our final authority because that's what we know God says, right? Um an interpretation from a, a great leader, we take that a bit with a grain of salt. We we give them respect for their knowledge and you know that they've attained and their experience, but we take that with a grain of salt. We compare that to scripture and does it make sense? I love that. Does it make actual sense? Um, also, please know that I care for all people who do not yet see the glorious reality of Christ and who they and who they were really made and intended to be in Him. I want to always ensure I am doing outreach God's way to all individuals, and this includes people in the LGBTQ plus community. While I disagree with their lifestyle, I am for them as people in, in the sense that I want, I am for them as people in the sense that I want them to choose to repent and turn towards Christ so they are not sent eternally away from God at Judgment Day. And I just want to park here for a second. I've read this article a couple times and this really stood out to me because this is, I know this is Chris's heart. He really does love every single person. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, I've seen him love on some of the lowest, uh, what we would consider the lowest life people. And um, he's genuine. So when he says that LGBTQ plus, it doesn't matter what sin, lifestyle of sin. We all have, before we came, we got saved, we had a lifestyle of sin and we all were in the same boat, separated from God under his wrath, right? So, we don't see, he doesn't see them, uh, anyone, as lesser or not valuable, <clears throat> but he, he, he really does try to reach out to those people, and he wants to show compassion. That should be our attitude, all of our attitudes as Christians. That's my attitude. I want to let you know that I want to be your friend just as much, no matter who you are. I love you as a person. You have innate value as an individual created in God's image, um, regardless of how you identify. Um, before we even get to that, you're a person, and, and that starts right there, your value. Um, so that's huge. That's a huge point. And he doesn't, he, he's, he's saying his compassion is that they would, his desire is that they would turn and repent and choose Christ. See, that's the whole point of this, right? That's my whole point of my videos is that we are, true compassion is sometimes speaking the truth even though it's hard because we want people to turn and repent. Why? Because we don't, not just because we want to make them happy in this life, um, but, but we care about their eternity, where they're going to spend eternity. Are they going to spend it with God in heaven or are they going to spend it in an eternal judgment in hell separated from God? We all would be there without the grace of God. And, and so we want all people to turn. We want all people to embrace the news that we embraced, even though it was difficult because we want them to be saved. Huge, huge, huge point right there. <clears throat> um, he says, the Bible is very clear that God's justice against sin is coming to everyone who has chosen to reject Christ. I don't want anyone to have to face God as the eternal judge without being found in him. The current controversy, he titles subtitle, for those who are, <clears throat> for those who are unaware there is a popular pastor named Alistair Begg who has recently and publicly endorsed an ever-growing popular opinion in the church that it is okay to attend the celebration of a legal union between two individuals who are LGBTQ+, as long as the individuals know where you stand on the issue, i.e. that you believe the Bible to categorize it as sin. This, in many cases, well-intentioned believers feel as if this is one of the necessary ways that we can show an increasingly anti-Christian culture, the light of Christ. They believe that this is a compassionate Christian thing to do. I will start with this thesis statement up front so that it gives you a quick roadmap to where I am headed. I fully intend to back this proof text, back this with proof text from scripture. He emboldens this part. He says, as Christians, we are never permitted to go to any event slash place where the chief goal of such an event slash place is to celebrate sin. He does say there are a couple of uh, exceptions to this. These are pretty much these, these are pretty much obvious and goes without saying. Number one exception, while attending, you are not viewed as an active participant from either the couple or anyone in the crowd. 
And you are going only to make that explicitly clear in order to espouse God's truth and call to repentance. Example, Elijah on Mount Carmel. So just as Elijah publicly proclaimed the truth and, and witnessed to the truth, he's saying that, you know, it, it could be a possible exception. It may not be the wise, I would say, I would add, it may not be the wisest thing to do all the time, but God may call you to go and, and just publicly state the truth that this is not okay with God and 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 provide and the give everyone the gospel give everyone the testimony of the truth so that all might might hear the truth and hopefully be saved be drawn to Christ uh, Elijah was a testimony a public testimony to the truth what's the second example the second example he gives is you are an you are an emergency service provider who's called to such a place to save a life like a paramedic firefighter or police officer that's pretty much pretty obvious you're not joining in the celebration you're there to save lives that's your job some individuals on the opposite side of the issue would go as far as to suggest that such a statement is pharisaical and isn't aligned well with Jesus' approach to sinners, which is captured in his statement in Luke 5.31. Now, if you watch the, the 45, 47-minute response um, on Sunday night, I think it was January 28th, if I'm not mistaken, with Alistair Begg, where he responded to his critics um, on the advice that he gave, his whole message basically was compa what he viewed as compassion which is going to a gay wedding in certain circumstances um, to build a bridge, to be a testimony. That would be the compassion side. And the, and the other side, the condemnation side, would be the pharisaical. So anyone that believes that it's wrong, no matter what, like, like except for these two exceptions, they would be considered pharisaical. Um, that's the light that we're painted with. Um, I hate that, but I know that some of you may watching this right now may even feel that. Um, my quick retort i won't go off too much on this but if if we're grieved and we're cry we cry about that is that pharisaical or is that the holy spirit i don't see it as pharisaical i know that i don't i, I definitely don't see that pharisaical want, want didn't want people to be saved they didn't care they just want to look better than other people and that's the furthest thing from my heart um and i i, I know that of my brother as well so he says he said it is not and so he's is addressing this passage in Luke five thirty one, where Jesus with, with Jesus approach to sinners, it is not the healthy who need a physician, but the sick. That's what Jesus said. And Chris goes on and says, I believe this is fel fallacious thinking. Um, and I will attempt not Jesus' statement, but that this that we should go to a gay wedding because we're 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 misapplying that verse he says i believe this is fallacious thinking and i will attempt to show why to do that i believe it will be good to work backwards from the apostles to christ what i mean is this let's start looking at these issues through the lens of explicit instructions from the apostles peter and paul first i think seeing how the apostles taught us how how we are to abstain from meeting with sinners in certain places and venues more on this as we go will go a long way in helping us observe Jesus' ministry to unbelievers in a more calibrated and balanced manner. Jesus did instruct the apostles to teach us to observe all things that I have commanded you. Thus we know they wouldn't teach us contrary to what they understood Christ to teach them. And he has the, the next heading, apostolic instruction on attending, participating in sinful celebrate, celebrations or events. First, he's going to quote a passage from 1 Peter. This is something that is an excellent point. 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5, this is what that passage says. For the time that is for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Again, 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5. Key word in there, they are surprised. Now, he's going he's gonna to cover this, so I'm going to read this without saying too much yet myself. He says, Chris says, Notice a couple things about the Gentile unbelievers based on Christians refraining from participating in their sinful actions slash celebrations. Number one, they were surprised. That, that word is is in the text. They were surprised that we would tell them what we are, that we are not able to participate in these events. 
such as, and he gives, Chris gives the example, such as drinking parties, due to our, due to our belief in Christ's teaching. Would it, would it be ever right for us to go to a drinking party if we knew that was the, the main theme of the event? Were people getting drunk? No, because that's a clear sin in Scripture. That's If that's celebrating that sin, that's what it's all about. So when the world asks us to be participate and be involved in something that is all about affirming or celebrating a particular sin, and we don't do it, they're surprised. Peter says they're, they're surprised by it. They're, they're going to be surprised by it. That's, that's how they're going to react. Number two, and, it's in, and he says, they malign us for our position. That's what Chris says. That word malign, I believe, is in the text as well. As Peter says, they malign you. Um, they malign us for our position. They show hatred towards us by slandering. They try to say, oh, we're, we're bigots, we're hateful because we won't go to that wedding. Um, if it's a loved one and they're, you know, and they're going to cut us off and they say we're being hateful to them because we won't go to their wedding, their special day. And, and that's, that's really deeply special to them and we won't go to that. That feels like hate to them. I mean, we can't expect the world, the lost, to understand everything about the truth because they are do not know Christ. They desire the things of the world. They desire their sin, and that is uh, against God. And and but but their natural re reaction and their sinful nature is going to be, you guys, what's wrong with you? You guys have the problem. You're maligning. You're, I mean, you're hating and you're a bigot. I can't believe that you wouldn't come to my wedding. I can't believe that. That hurts. And that's that's, you know, you're they're they're gonna they're gonna say things like that. And Peter says, they're surprised by it. They're and then they malign you. Um, this is no this should be no surprise to us because Peter the Bible warned about it. It talked about it um, that this would happen. Um. I feel like we're taking on our heels a lot. We're taking off our heels and we're like, what do we do? Like, it, it's hard on one sense. It's it's emotionally trying because it's our family, it's our friends, and we don't want to lose them. We don't want them to cut us off. We don't want to burn bridges. But at the same time, we have to have fidelity, uh, faithfulness to Christ. And we have to stand for the truth that will be truly compassionate. And we'll get to that, which will actually be more helpful to them in the end, in the long run. Um, but it's hard. I'm not saying it's not hard. It's a hard thing, but it's it's an easy, the Bible makes it easy on what is right to do, what's right and wrong. That's that's not a hard one to understand. Um, he says, as a brief aside, doesn't this sound familiar? Merely by our refusal to participate in worldly activities and celebrations, the world will malign us by how we live our lives. We are never to look at the world's reaction and to allow that to dictate our fidelity to Christ and his word. I love that statement. We are never to look at the world's reaction and allow that to dictate our fidelity to Christ and his word. If we look and say, oh man, they're going to just put us in that bucket of being judgmental. That's just going to turn them off even more. Um, you know, we, if we let that guide what we do and we, we, we go, we, we depart from scripture then we're departing from faithfulness to Christ. And they'll say, well, how, what do you do about that? How do you not lose them? You know, it isn't, you know, it, it are, are, does God really want us to lose them and cut, have them cut us off? We'll, we'll get to that because there is, there's more to that, 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 that and, and what true compassion is and what, what, what will be most effective. Um, <clears throat> so, but there's, there's that, that's, there's, that's the tension. Um, but we're never to do that. We're never to make that sacrifice of fidelity to Christ. Um, he says, he emboldens this part. He says, implicit in Peter's statement is him applauding the church for their abstinence from such things slash events. Peter's saying, this, this is how you are. This, this is good that you're, this is normal for you, right? He's applauding them. Not chast, he, it's not, you don't see in this, and, he, and Chris says, not chastising them for being unwilling to go even to those places to build bridges with the world. He never, he's not, you know, chastising them for not doing that. He's saying that they're going to be spies, they're going to malign you, but that's normal. That's normal. That's that's what you're to, to expect. Oh, not, oh, you need to build more bridges because apparently they're maligning you means something's wrong and you're turning them away from Christ. <clears throat> 
So the question then becomes, well, what if I am not agreeing and or committing sexual immorality myself at the LGBTQ plus event? I have already already made it clear I don't agree with their stance. In light of that, am I not allowed to show them that I care for the, that them? I care for them by attending. And he says, Paul helps. To, and that's a good question. I mean, that's a question that we're going to hear a lot from people. I've heard that. You know, it's a, it's a bit, I believe it's a bit of a surface question, but it, it is relevant. Paul helps to further clarify. He says, Paul helps to cur- further clarify what the Spirit says to the churches on this topic. And here's the, here's the key passage in this whole thing. This is where it gets. Don't lose, I don't want to lose you here, okay? This is key for us to, there's no wiggle room when you, when you read this passage. This gets right down to you know exactly what the heart of this issue is and what it boils down to he says this this is the passage i'm going to read first corinthians 10 14 to 22 therefore my beloved flee from idolatry i speak as to sensible people judge for yourselves what i say the cup of blessing that we bless is is it not a participation in the blood of christ the bread that we break is it not a participation in the body of christ because there is one bread who are we? We who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord <clears throat> to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Some pretty strong words about that. What are we? What is God thinking of this? Are we provoking him to jealousy by, by joining in idolatry? Are we stronger than God that we would, we would dare to do that? That, that's a pretty serious thing. What this passage is talking about, and Chris will go on to explain, but basically the nutshell of what this pastor's talk, passage is talking about is that the Corinthians were going into pagan temples and they were, maybe they weren't praying directly to those idols themselves, but they were eating meats that were sacrificed to idols in those temples. The whole ceremony, the whole religious service, the whole thing in the temple was all about idolatry and worshiping idols. And they were right there. And, and, and Paul was saying, I don't want you to be participants with them. You know, these are demons. These are demons that they're worshiping. Um, the idol itself is not anything, but there's a demon behind it, basically. And he's like, you can't partake of the Lord's table on one hand when you go to church and then demons on the other and be part of that. Like that, that, those two things don't go together. Are you, are you provoking God to jealousy? And, and Chris says in verse 14, again, 1 Corinthians 10, 14 to 22, in verse 14, Paul assumes that what he's about to say will be understood by sensible people. In other words, this isn't a hard one. This is something that sensible people should be able to understand very clearly. In other words, he, ex- he expects the logical connections that follow to be comprehended by them. He, he emboldens this part. He says, I speak as to sensible people, judge, judge for yourselves what I say. That's what Paul said. Paul is equating believers eating the Lord's Supper as being participants of that ceremony. <clears throat> Just as ancient Israelites eating of the sacrifice were considered a partaker of that ceremonial event. He then applies this same logic to attendance of a pagan celebratory worship service where actual sacrifice to an idol is taking place, i.e. a place where sin is celebrated. Likewise, just as knowingly going to a pagan ceremony, thus becoming a default participant, was prohibited by Paul, the spirit and intent of this command would extend to the the modern pagan temple by willful attendance to an LGBTQ plus legal union celebration. And according to Paul, that person would now have a share in the sacrifices, i.e., Here's some examples of how you would have to share in the sacrifices or celebration of the worship of idolatry, of 
something that is against God, that is um, a, an abomination, basically. And here's some examples he gives. He says, i.e. eating the cake. I would argue that the cake is one of the biggest symbols of the marriage union. I.e. eating the cake, congratulating the individuals. You know, there's a line at the end where you shake their hand and congratulate them um, <clears throat> on their union, going to the reception and buying a gift, etc. There is no moral difference as well. At, at, there is no moral difference as all celebration of iniquity is an, is ultimately a form of idolatry. And that's what it is. Like anything that we celebrate that sin, we're, we're putting that above God. We're saying that God, what you say is, is doesn't matter. I love this sin, this thing that is against you instead of you. That's why it's so wrong. We all, we all fail to that at times and God convicts us and we repent if we're Christians. But this is wholesale running headlong, identifying with adultery and affirming and celebrating that. And the couple are making a vows to, to, to stay with each other forever. And, and if they make those vows, they keep those vows. They are, they, they will be going to hell. There's no, there's no one that can then live a practice life of sin and, and identify with that and shake and, and just whatever God's not caring what God says and just live that way and, and go to heaven. I mean, that's not, that's not a true believer. They don't have the Holy spirit. There's no, the Bible is clear. First John is clear on that. Um, so, so another, and so, and then he says, another important observation is this, Paul is speaking to the location and intent of the event. He boldens this part. Paul is speaking to the location and intent of the event, not our intentions as individuals. I mention this because I believe that some people think, well, whether it's right or wrong, God knows my heart as to why I'm going. I submit to you that it's, that it's possible many of the believers in Corinth could have also just wanted to go because they wanted to show their pagan friends or family that they still love them. However, Paul didn't give this as a caveat or make this as a matter of conscience. Rather, he tells them their, their mere presence in a pagan temple uh, while the celebration to the false god was going on would stir God to jealousy. He warned, his warning is pretty stark for attendance to something that is against God's natural law. You cannot, and again, the quote, the quote, you cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So, yeah, I mean, we can't, you know, it's it's very clear. There's no caveat there. Uh, well, your, my intentions were good. It's nothing about that. It's about the actions of what, what's actually happening, what we're doing. Lastly, now, before he, he goes on, I just want to quickly, there is a parallel passage, I believe, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, and I'm going to start in verse 14. Sounds very familiar, and I'm just going to read this because it's very relevant, and it's very clear what we need to do. It says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? The temple of God with idols simply means that The temple of God, sorry, my video is uh, looks like it's frozen for a second there. The temple of God with idols simply means that we are the temple of the, of the Holy Spirit and we're going into a, a temple of idols. We have no place, no business there. It says, uh, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He says, come out from among them. Be separate. You know, you're different. You're, you're, you know, you don't have, you have a Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You, you have no place in a place of idols, a place of idolatry. Just absolutely crystal clear. It just it dovetails so perfectly with the First Corinthians passage. But that's that's Second Corinthians six. So I'll get back to the article. Lastly, this is Chris uh, saying. Lastly, to point out the obvious, Paul is addressing believers here. 
In other words, I don't think all of these particular Corinthian believers are attending these idol feasts with the intent to honor the false god in question rather than Christ. Paul corrects them by bluntly saying that as Christians, we are not given this as an option of conscience. The attendance of the legal celebratory union of an LGBTQ plus couple is similarly prohibited because you are celebrating idolatry by attending and feasting with them during the actual sinful event. It has both element it has both elements of tacit approval, i.e., your mere presence. So your mere presence is is in and of itself saying it's not that bad. Um, I'm here on your special day. I know it's important enough for you, uh, so I will be here. And for your wedding, and I will, you know, it's, they're getting the impression that it's approval. They're going to, it's just, you know, you're a witness, you're a part of, you're a participant in that wedding. It is, there's no way, really way around that to say that it's tacit approval. Um, it's tacit approval, i.e. your mere presence. An explicit approval, if you're buying them gifts, congratulate, congratulating them, etc., so that's even worse. I mean, you're you're in how many people are going to go to the wedding and just sit there with a stoic look on your face or a grieving look on your face, um, which is, you know, hard, very difficult to do and not smile, not when they're walking down the aisle, smile and approval, smile and, you know, um, congratulating them and giving them a gift, applauding when people applaud, um, laughing when people laugh, you know, just the whole nine yards. Um, those are clear, explicit approval examples. He says, regardless of your internal conviction against it, he said, you're, you know, those, both those elements are going to be there at the wedding, regardless of how you feel inside, regardless of how you don't, that you don't approve inside. And then he, he kind of turns a corner a little bit. Now this is very relevant, but he's, he's going to another passage. He wants to talk about the greatest commandment, the greatest commandment when asked what the greatest commandment was Jesus responded like this and this is the passage from Matthew 22 30, 36 through 40 it says teacher which is the great commandment in the law and he said to them you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the great and first commandment and a second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets Additionally, James gives us practical ways to fulfill these commandments with the following. He, he, re, he reads another passage, James 1.27. Hang with me, because these are very pertinent, absolutely pertinent for us to understand what God's priority, what God thinks of this. So in James 1.27, it says this, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. And then he has brackets there, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, that's the first part and to keep oneself um, from being polluted by the world. And that and that verse would be, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So you have the second commandment listed first there, and then the first commandment listed. <clears throat> Notice that James mentions what the greatest commandment looks like, to keep ourselves from being stained by the world. He then gives an example of loving your neighbors by being there for orphans and widows in their distress. The first and greatest commandment is the first position for a reason. It is what every decision revolves around in the Christian's life. When it appears that upholding something in this, now this catch this is so, so important. In light of the first and second commandment, when it appears that upholding something in the second commandment would cause me to betray the first, then I have clearly discerned incorrectly. And I am not really operating in the true spirit and love of Christ. Rather, I am now in opposition to it. I must filter through the first and greatest commandment in order to know how to properly implement the second. In other words, we got to love the Lord our God first, first. You know, if we're, we're loving our neighbor first and that is contradicting what God says is loving to him, we got something wrong, very, very wrong. And rather than stir God to jealousy, we got to take a step back. And, and obey him first, and then <clears throat> love our neighbor as ourself, <clears throat> as it's filtered through the love of God. In some current Christian cult, and he emboldens this next part, in some, let me take a drink real quick. <clears throat> in some current Christian culture, 
I see these commands practically being flipped, and I do too. I mean, that's, you know, we hear love your neighbor so much after COVID. And, you know, don't, you know, you don't go to church, don't, you know, close church for a long time. You know, the whole BLM thing, you know, we can go on and on and on. Like everything was about love your neighbor and accept this leftist leaning uh, change in your life. Um, and, and it says, I see these commands practically being flipped. Rather than really seeking to uphold the first and greatest commandment, we seem to elevate, at times, a misapplication of the second commandment. In such a scenario, this discussion seems to inevitably go to an argument from conscience, keyword there, conscience, rather than a clear prohibition in Scripture. As an aside, many people use the argument from conscience incorrectly as Scripture represents it. That will be for another article. However, suffice it to say, for now, Issues of conscience are always amoral in nature. In other words, they aren't intrinsically immoral or, or moral. They are truly neutral, and there is freedom in Christ to participate in morally neutral activities provided our liberty does not cause someone to stumble. Now, that's in the, in the same passage, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, or it might be 11, it might, but it's right in the same passage where... He's talking about, hey, don't provoke God to jealousy. Don't go in the temples and eat meat sacrificed to idols. But then he says, there is a matter of conscience by you can eat meat in the marketplace that may have been sacrificed to idols as long as you don't cause your brother to stumble. Like that is different. The marketplace is a, you know, a neutral place. It's a place where meat is bought and sold and it's not for the purpose of, of worshiping idols. <clears throat> That's not the place or the venue that, that celebrates sin. So it's okay, you know, you have freedom. You have your, as long as your conscience allows you, you can do that. And also you're not causing your brother to stumble. Big difference, but a big difference there. Um, so he's, he's arguing this is not a conscience issue to go to a gay wedding. He says many people with good intentions start with their own interpretation of what it looks like to love their neighbor. And unfortunately it has caused them to fail at loving God by how they chose to love their neighbor. We really need to go to the scripture to see the objective teaching on this so we don't imperil ourselves or others with misguided advice. Jesus did not take lightly the woman Jezebel in Revelation when she enticed God's people, when she enticed God's people to commit sexual immorality and to catch this. In Revelation, the woman Jezebel enticed them not to only commit sexual immorality, but to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Obviously, he's he's saying that's wrong here. So this is not the meat sacrificed to idols for conscience' sake that that would, that you that you found in the market you bought in the market. This is the going into the temple, and he says this is what Revelation two twenty says. But I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Question for reflection, pastors. Are you even tolerating someone's encouraging others in your congregation to attend an event where the chief goal of the event is to celebrate sin? My loving plea to you is this. You need to be very careful how you tread here. The Lord is patient with our ignorance. But once you clearly see Scripture's stance on this, you must make public correction. So no more individuals are led astray by this pervasive teaching. You know, that's such an important point. You know, pastors and leaders... They, they're putting this in matter of conscience, but if they ought to go back to the scripture and see that it's not, because when they see that, they'll realize that all these people, they've led astray, and they need to go back and repent and, and undo the damage that they've done, because this is serious. It is actually in a gospel-adjacent or a gospel-affecting issue, and whether you want to call it a primary or a secondary, it's, I would call it a sub primary issue it, it, it fact clearly affects the foundation and the need for a person to feel the need to repent and be saved they don't they don't see that if you're affirming their sin um that's why it's so important now with the apostles authoritative teaching on this subject laid as a framework and realizing that the holy spirit through jesus own life would not contradict that of their instruction to the church Let's now analyze Jesus' interaction with the unbelievers through the lens of Peter and Paul's instructions. We will see if his life is consistent with his spirit, with what his spirit instructed them to teach the churches on these matters. 
And it says, Jesus, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. That's what they accused him of. So the Son of Man, Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is indeed justified by her deeds. According to Jesus in the above text, the, the people, example, Pharisees, believe Jesus' fellowship with unbelievers even in what we I will refer to as a morally, he boldens this, a morally neutral, uh, morally neutral places and events made him a glutton and a drunkard with them. So if he just goes and sits and have a meal, and they they have drank, been gluttons and drunkards before, but he ha if he sits there and has a meal with them, and that meal is a completely neutral meal, going to a restaurant with your gay friends would be an example, they clearly viewed this as sinful. We see circumstantial evidence of how the Pharisees thought about this when Jesus was in Simeon's house. And in Luke 7, 36 through 50, he quotes this passage. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And when he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table, behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the anointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known of who or what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. That's Luke 7, 36 through 50. What do we observe from Simon the Pharisee through the, this pattern above? The Pharisees fell into the trap of assuming a form of guilt by association. He emboldens that. Guilt by association. A Pharisee wouldn't even be caught with a sinner, even in morally neutral places and events. I mean, that was right in the Pharisee's house, was it not? I mean, that's, I mean, if anything, that was morally neutral to them, if not sanctified. But it, it definitely wasn't a place of sin, uh, affirming sin. Whereas Jesus was more than happy to go, he, I'm getting back to the article, he says, whereas Jesus was more than happy to go into their house, break bread, talk to them in the streets, at a well, etc. Do you see this? He emboldens this. You will never find Jesus at any event with sinners where the chief goal of the event is to celebrate that which God hates. That is, that's it right there, folks. It, what is the chief aim or goal of, of the event? Is it just to eat and, and enjoy fellowship and company with somebody? Or is it to fellowship in sin, to participate in the celebration of sin? We see in the attitude of Simon the Pharisee that he thought it was detestable for Jesus to allow a prostitute to even touch his feet in humble, in humble repentance. This is in part what makes someone a Pharisee. One, once a person was marked for the sin they were known to frequently commit, the Pharisees then deemed them not associable even in morally neutral places and events. To hit this point home in a more profound way, do you believe that Jesus would have hung out and spoken to a prostitute while she was doing work in the bedroom, actively defiling herself? That's an excellent question. I mean, you might say that's a straw man, but, but that's... That's the same idea. It's, it's where sin is being performed and celebrated. And he says that here. He says, of course not. This is a place where sin is being celebrated. Do you believe Jesus would go to the wedding of someone who is getting ready to marry an animal and bring a gift to show this person that they still love them and aren't judging them? Of course not. That is a place where sin is being celebrated. What about someone wanting to take, wanting Jesus to take them to, to their hypothetical equivalent of an abortion clinic. Would it be loving for Jesus to drive them there and wait for them until they are finished? Of course not. Do you see the pattern now? In fact, if you answered no to any of the above scenarios but are fine with it in the case of an LGBTQ plus legal union, this is a good test to reveal the desensitization uh, you, have, you have to this particular sin in our culture and you are not being morally consistent. No, I don't. he's not trying to come down hard on people. I mean, this is kind of where we're, a lot of us are at, as a church. We're just so used to being that those frogs boiling in the pot of water. It just keeps getting turned up slightly. We don't even realize it. We think that we're being loving every time it gets, you know, we make another a little bit of a compromise to um, turn it up when it gets turned up a little bit. 
but pretty soon we don't realize how much the temperature has been turned up. Um, and my, I argue that Al Alistair Bay kind of turned it up a little too much, caused a lot of people to be like, well, wait a minute. Like, I've listened to this guy all my life, but I mean, that's that's a bridge too far. That's that's going too far. And a lot of, thank the Lord, that a lot of frogs uh, frogs are waking up and jumping out. And But you that this is just, if, if you were finally going to a gay wedding, but you know it's wrong to go, you wouldn't go to a, a pet wedding or, um, you know, driving someone to an abortion clinic and helping them out with that. Or, you know, the, these other examples, this, uh, this other example, he gave another example here as well. Um, if you're, if, if you're not fine with those, there's no real difference, no substantive difference there. Um, they're both sin and they're both celebrating those sins. So why would you, if that means that's much special and you're trying to build a bridge to that person, why not go to their wedding with their pet? If it gets to that point where someone's marrying their pet, they might be delusional, but all sin is delusional. All sin is deception and all sin will lead to hell, right? So all, if you embrace that sin, you're going to go to hell. If you embrace and live in that you know, so it's, it's the same, these are the same, substantively the same things. And so these are, these are not morally neutral places. And so he, he's really bringing out that, that shows that how desensitized you've actually already become. If you've like, oh, I don't know about a gay wedding. I think, I think that's okay. And sort no, no, like it's the same thing. It's still sin against God. It still celebrates. It still affirms it. It doesn't matter who, who, who your family member is. Jesus came to bring peace, uh, not to bring peace, but a sword and to divide father and mother and son and daughter. He, he says it. That's another thing we shouldn't be surprised by. Jesus said this ahead of time. We're starting to face that now. Are we ready for it? Are we ready to, to, to say, Jesus, I'm going to be faithful to you. We're here. We're here at the juncture right now. We're here at the crossroads in America, and we're starting to have to make these decisions. Let's make let's let's not compromise. Let's stay true to Christ. <clears throat> now he says, now would Jesus be willing to have fellowship with them in their curiosity of who he is and what he is teaching in morally neutral places? Of course. At risk of stating the obvious, remember this. And before I do that, I'm going to take a drink. <clears throat> he, he emboldens this. Jesus wasn't really a glutton and a drunkard. He was around people who were known to be both and was then falsely accused of being that by the Pharisees. This is what being a Pharisaical is, is in such a circumstance. It is not being Pharisaical and unloving to honor God before we ever honor our neighbors in an unbiblical way. Another emboldened section, he says, so the next time... And this is important for all of you. I've read this a couple of times, so I know what he's about to say. This is important for all of us that get discouraged, <clears throat> that get a lot of pushback. And, you know, it's it's hard. It's hard to stand and look like you're being divisive and look like you're you're just, you know, just coming down hard and being pharisaical and all the things that they call you. It's hard to stay in that stance and, and stand for Christ and keep doing that. But if you're doing it... You, you're, if you're, you're, you're obeying Christ, and, and I pray that your motive is, is right too with compassion for the lost and for Christ and love for Christ. But he says this, and I think it will be encouraging to you. So the next time someone wants to try to say you are being a Pharisee for taking the position against attendance to an immoral celebration, don't feel defeated. You now know this is an unfortunate oversimplified analysis of what being a Pharisee is, and you can now help them to see the difference. It's a clear difference. It's about what is the event about? Is it celebrating sin? Is it affirming sin? Or is it a morally neutral place? <clears throat> and he says, here's the conclusion. For every specific prohibition in scripture, there is a consistent moral principle present at its foundation. Apostolic construction isn't arbitrary. Circling back to how the article began, we have sufficient scripture to know that in the case of the question of where Christians are allowed to go to build bridges with the world, he emboldens this, we are not permitted to attend any event or place where the chief goal of such an event or place is to celebrate sin. However, we are, of course, allowed to meet with unbelievers on morally neutral territory as Jesus did during his ministry. 
A celebration of the legal union of two people that are LGBTQ plus is not a morally neutral event. It meets the spirit and intent of Paul's prohibition to the Corinthian believers to not attend the pagan temple as a participant. And he emboldens this. Thus, I am calling on all brothers and sisters, especially those in leadership positions, to cease telling fellow Christians that this issue of attending a celebration of sin is a matter of conscience. The apostles' teaching and observation of Jesus' life and ministry gives us no room for that. Are we trying to, to stir God to jealousy? This is not a matter of conscience. The scripture is clear. We are treading on very scary ground when we do that before God. And, it, and I, don't, oh, I don't say that lightly. I don't say that with glee or joy because I, you know, because I, I disagree with that and someone does. I, I, I just, we, you know, this is what the Bible says and I, this is, you know, this is serious. Do we want to risk circumventing the authority that Jesus gave the apostles and replace it with what we feel is right in our eyes, in our own eyes? Is that something you are willing to stand before God and defend? Please consider that we do this at the risk of being reprimanded by the one we say we are committed to follow, our Lord Jesus Christ. Attending such events is actually not compassionate or loving. It shows a misunderstanding of what Christ is really calling the world to. Unbelievers need to see how serious God is about their decisions. And this is what I hit on a lot of my videos. They, they need to see the seriousness of it. Um, and the best, he says, they need to see how the serious how serious God is about their decisions and the best way to love them in such a scenario is to explain that the reason you are not able to attend is because it would cause you to encourage them on a path that you really believe will end. And this is it. This is this for me. This is, this is the big point here. This is it, it will, because it would end on a path that will lead, will end in eternal judgment for them eternal judgment. You know, we're, we're, we're so worried and so concerned about building a bridge so that they, they know that we accept them here. And we know that as a person anyway, or, or that, you know, maybe they'll build a bridge and, and maybe they'll feel more loved and they'll ask, you know, more about Jesus. And somehow we think that if they're happy with us, that's going to somehow lead them to see their need to repent of their sin. But we're concerned about it. They're more than being accepted, more than being affirmed, more than not losing that relationship here and now. We're concerned about their eternal, what true compassion is concerned about their eternal state. Eternal judgment awaits those who live in this way and identify and, and champion this lifestyle. Will this make them upset? Good question. Because you say, and one of the questions that, that I asked at the beginning is like, you're probably asking, you know, am I going to lose them? How am I going to not lose them? Will this make them upset? The answer is possibly, you know, most likely, I would say. But this is the answer to that. Is that always a bad thing? Is that a bad thing that they're upset for this, for you making a, a calm and compassionate answer to say, no, I can't for this reason? Um, however, was it necessary to, was it necessary to put a stone in their shoe, so to speak for years to come? Absolutely. Now, what he means by a stone in their shoe is it's something that's just constantly like there when they walk around constantly there in their mind, in their heart, that just like bothers them. They, when they know that you don't affirm and they, they know that you didn't go to their wedding, that's going to bother them. That's going to always be there to be a check against everyone else that affirmed them and be like, maybe that wasn't right. Maybe, like this person stood true to what they believe the word. And, and they, according to them, I'm, I'm in serious trouble with God and I need to repent. I need to be saved. They're thinking that, you know, they might try to frame it in the sense that you're, you're being a bigot and you hate them, but they know deep down inside that you love them. And they know deep down inside that, that, that bothers them. That's a, that's a pebble in their shoe, if you will, a stone in their shoe. He says, yeah, absolutely, it will be. It's necessary for that to happen. Your attendance is not going to suddenly open a door for you one day to convince them 
that they need to repent and break from such a lifestyle. It, what you're doing is you're actually lessening the seriousness of their sin so they don't see as much of a need to repent. That's what that's my that's my ad right there. But that's what he's saying. It's not going to do that. He says, I argue rather than lead them to repentance. He says, I argue will do the opposite. And I'm saying the same thing. It is going to less is going to, going to cause them to be lulled to sleep in their sin, be be more hardened, more more unchecked in their sin. And they need the word of God. They need the truth to check them. That's what the word of God did to all of us. It checked our hearts. It checked where we were, that we were going astray. It showed us our sin. It, the law, God's law is a tutor to point us to the fact that we're sinners and we need we need a savior. How do we know we need a savior unless we're we're checked in our heart and our spirit? Unless we have that pebble, that stone in our shoe that's constantly there until we finally say, ah, oh, like, I'm wrong. I need, I need Jesus. I, you know, some, I'm, thank God that some truth was still there in my life and I, and it was, it's still, that light was still there pointing to Christ, pointing to the need for Christ, the need for repentance, because I, 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 I couldn't get around the fact that I was in sin. I couldn't get around. Somebody tested, testified to that. It wasn't easy. It wasn't, it, it was a unpopular thing to do, but they still did it. And he says, he goes on to say, after saying he believes it will do the opposite, which is I absolutely 100% agree. He says, please let me please let me know if you have any questions or comments. I will try to respond as I have time. Grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with uh, uh, with love incorruptible. Ephesians 6, 24. And that's Chris Goff. <clears throat> and he hits home this, this, this point at the end that true compassion is warning someone. That's I've said that in my other one of my other videos. It's warning them. If we see that they're on their way to hell, if we see if a doctor, someone comes to the, if I come to the doctor and he sees that I have cancer, he the, the compassionate thing to do is not to put his arm around me and say, "Oh, you've been feeling bad, but you'll you'll get better." You know, like uh, you should probably eat right. You should probably you know be healthy and you know. But you know, I, I don't I don't condone the you know the lifestyle, the smoking that you're doing and all that. But, you know, if, if that's if that's your thing, you know, like, uh, you know, I'll go buy you a pack of cigarettes if you if you, you know, you're running out of money or whatever. I'll just be part of that. I'll, I'll endorse that to a certain on a certain level, even though I'm not as a doctor endorsing it. You're sending mixed messages. You're, he's sending mixed messages. He's he's not really helping me. He's putting his arm around and being nice to me. But the whole time I have cancer or I'm I'm going to get cancer and die and he knows it and he's not warning me a doctor has to tell the truth don't you want to know the truth of the severity of your cancer if it's going to kill you so that you can have chemo and or whatever is needed to try to save your life don't you want to try to save your own life and and, and if you would as a christian if you're listening to that don't you want to try to save don't don't your loved ones that are not saved your lgbtq friends family don't you want to save their life, their eternal soul? You know, we, you know I've heard, and, and I'm just going to add this. I've heard the argument that, oh, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts them, not us. Well, get, uh, no matter how you believe on that, like, we're still the means that God chooses to use. <clears throat> it says, how will they hear without a preacher? You know, God's not going to give dreams. That's not the average way he does that. He's going to just give dreams to someone to repent. The average way he uses it is you and me teaching them the message of the gospel, not just loving them and pointing to Christ by our love, but actually when we get the opportunity, when the Holy Spirit opens the door, we tell them the gospel, the gospel message that can save their soul. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. We trust that God's word will not return void and that when we give them the gospel, no matter how hard that is, because it does deal with sin, it does, they have to confront their sin in that, in that and see their need of a savior. They have to repent. But when we give that gospel, no matter how few judged they feel for a time, that gospel will not return void. And it is the most effective and the best thing on the planet Earth to save their soul. It's the only thing that will save their soul. And yes, the Holy Spirit convicts. We don't convict, but the truth convicts, the truth of the gospel. And we are the ones that, that give that truth, right? We are the ones that are responsible to testify and give that truth and represent that truth accurately. 
We're not represented accurate when we, accurately when we affirm a sinful lifestyle in any sense is okay. It just, it doesn't do it. It goes against it. it it's opposite. Do we want their soul to live in the end forever? How sad would it be if we thought we were loving someone to Jesus and we attended their, their sinful lifestyle events that celebrated their sin, they grew comfortable, more and more comfortable in that, happy with you and had a great relationship with you here on this earth, but then they died in, in their sin and did not repent and they went to hell for eternity and you get to heaven and you have to face God for leading that person astray when you could have told them the truth. And you're in heaven and, and you say, well, I shouldn't have, we, God doesn't put all that on us. Well, I, I, I dare say that he does to a certain extent because Paul said he preached the gospel. I'm, I'm paraphrasing that, but he says, I'm free from the blood of all men. I'm free from the blood of my hands. There's another passage that deals with that as well, but we can actually have the blood of, of someone on our hands. If we fail to give them the gospel, when God's put them us in their lives and given us that opportunity and let us and open the doors and we failed to do that and we gave we actually led them in the other direction is even worse i'll just end with that that statement i i oh, i'm sorry i got off on my own tangent i know chris we've been through many, we've had many talks on this and i know he'd agree with me um on that but he just moves faithfully through the passages that deal directly with the heart of the issue is is it a morally neutral place? Is it idol worship that we're in a place of idol worship and idolatry and sin that is being celebrated? That is the key thing. First Corinthians 10 deals directly with that. There's no wiggle room. And um, I would just say, if you're a pastor, if you're um, if you're a parishioner, if you're a parishioner, <laughs> sound like a Catholic or something, if you're a, a layman, a regular person like me, um, a normie in the pew, um, if you're someone that is just starting to wonder about this and weren't starting to just weren't sure or just said, well, I just want to, I don't want to judge. And I, 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 you know, maybe I would, and then, you know, I don't know what I would do. Shore up what you believe. Go to the word yourself. Look at this, study it, pray and ask God to show you. If you still don't understand, still don't know. Cause I, I'm, I believe that God is faithful. He cares about his name and he cares about the souls and he wants them to be led to repentance. And yes, his kindness leads to repentance, but kindness in, in this scenario, kindness is warning, lovingly appealing people to be saved, showing them embracing love and accepting love in every other situation that we possibly can that's not affirming in a place that's not morally neutral. Um, so that's that's what this article was. Um, we should not celebrate, we should not, um, sacrifice our fidelity to Christ um, on the altar of a man's view, a world's view of compassion that's been tainted by the world. So that's what I got to say. Thank you very much. I hope this blessed you, encouraged you, convicted you, helped you in some way. Thank you very much. God bless.